And what we found is that the pigs, the, the batches that were affected that had first virus introduction, and then they were the quantile for a combination of PCV2 and Lausonia, which means they shed more these both pathogens. They had higher mortality compared with the other combinations of quantiles. Just to give some numbers to the audience, these groups, for example, had more than 15% of mortality in the growth finish. Compared with the ones with less quantiles of Lausonia and PCV2, they have below 10%. So was a, a significant difference when we analyzed in the statistical way. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me in our studios this week is uh, Dr. Guilherme Cesar. Uh, Dr. Cesar got his DVM in Brazil and practiced for a couple of years as a technical veterinarian doing service uh, for an autogenous vaccine company in the swine and poultry division. He then joined Iowa State University, where he got his master's in veterinary preventive medicine and is currently a PhD candidate in population science in animal health and coordinates the Swine Disease Reporting System Project. Dr. Cesar, thank you so much for coming back onto the podcast. It's always a pleasure to get to chat with you. Um, just in case there are some folks out there that aren't familiar with your work or haven't met you yet, why don't you give a brief introduction for the audience? Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you for having me back here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in the podcast again. Uh, like I said, I'm a, a veterinarian. I got my, my degree in, in Brazil, my, my DVM. And then I started to work in the industry there, like as a technical services in a vaccine company and moved to do my PhD here at Iowa State University, where I'm doing like research mostly uh, regarding co-infections of pathogens uh, in in the field, and also I coordinate the swine disease reporting system that most of the industry is familiar that we monitor swine pathogens here through PCR data and also sequencing. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Well, you have a unique perspective on all the different pathogens that we see. Um, you certainly have a perspective on, you know, um, the importance of pathogen management through your life as a practicing veterinarian. Um, and you've, uh, through SDRS, seen all the different, you know, diagnoses that we come up with. You get a chance to talk to, or to work on a project called the Dynamic Pig Health Project and try to understand some of these pathogen relationships with performance. Very complicated right? Especially when multiple pathogens are involved. So if you would, Guilherme, why don't you start by just giving the audience an overview of that project? What, what was it you were trying to study? How did you try to evaluate the pathogens and their impact? And, you know, we'll talk about what you learned from it. Perfect, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, uh, we, we have seen like in the field that usually we separate like pathogens in buckets, right? Like, oh, we, we have respiratory pathogens in my farm or enteric pathogens in my farm. But we usually we don't assess like the interaction among, uh, among different systems, right? Uh, like if we have an uh, animal that affected by digestive cases or like respiratory um, problems, how these two pathogens are interacting. And then trying to answer this question, uh, we have a partnership in the field epidemiology team here at Iowa State University and Beringer Ingerheim that join forces with us to assess like this burden, let's say, of these co-infections in the field. And the Dynamic Pig Health project born from this partnership that we, we, we have done. And what we did like for a start, the, the, the starting point of this project was following up uh, several flows of growth finished pigs uh, in one production system in particular. Uh, to be more precise, 75 uh, batches that we could follow up, uh, throwing some oral fluids since the weaning age until these animals go to the slaughterhouse. So, basically from three weeks of age until 33, 30 weeks of age. And then every two weeks, we were like um, using these oral fluids to assess the, the, the detection of mainly three pathogens that we started at this point, that was PERS virus, PCV2, and also Lausonia. 
And then after that, after doing all these testing results that we got, and just to give some numbers to the audience, these were more than 46,000 pigs that were following up throughout this period of more than one year. Uh, as I mentioned, 75 batches. But we selected the ones who had the higher performance in terms of uh, average daily gain and mortality, and the one with the lowest performance as well to do a comparison between them in these detection patterns of Lawsonia, PCV2, and PERS virus. You did a lot of diagnostics, Guilherme, and for PERS virus, we have a classification system. You know, we have the AASV classification system, but uh, admittedly, for PCV2 and for Lawsonia, we don't really have that. Um, did you did you come up with a classification system for those pathogens, a way to kind of put those batches of pigs into a status one Lawsonia or status two, status three, et cetera? And could you talk, if you did, could you talk about how you categorize that? Perfect, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, and I'm just following up with your question about the PERS virus as well, because we have a, we do have a classification system. It, it, it is important to mention to our audience that all these farms were like uh, stable or negative farms for PERS. So they were winning negative peaks. So they didn't have contact with PERS when they were placed in the finishing sites or the win to finish site. And then that's the first result that we got like... Um, basically, all the batches, because they were in a high-dense area, they got positive for PERS. So all these flows, basically all of them were positive uh, at the specific point of time. And like you mentioned, we had to try to classify. That was the one first classification that we did for these growing batches. Like, oh, when PERS enter specifically in this farm, was in the nursery part, in the early finish or late finish uh, period of, of, of life. And for the Lawsonia and PCV2, we tried to categorize in quantiles. So what we did is that all the detections that we had in the oral fluids throughout the life, how much these pigs shed throughout the whole life, this batch, right? So basically it's accumulating all the results of the qPCR and see how much they shed like one of these pathogens. Then we classify by quantiles, so one, two, three, four which one is the batches who shed less PCV2 and Lawsonia, and four, the ones who, less, uh, who shed more uh, PCV2 and Lawsonia. One, one category for each of them, right? And what we found is that the pigs, that, the batches that were affected, that had first virus introduction, and then there were the quantile four, a combination of PCV2 and Lawsonia, which means they shed more these both pathogens, they had higher mortality compared with the other combinations of quantiles. Just to give some numbers to the audience, these groups, for example, had more than 15% of mortality in the growth finish. Compared with the ones with less quantiles of Lawsonia and PCV2, they have below 10%. So was a, a significant difference when we analyze in the statistical way. Were there any other um, risk factors or inputs to the pig production con, uh, uh, process that can influence things like mortality that you were able to measure and characterize? And, and specifically, I mean, basic things like the, the genotype of the pigs, right? You know, a different sire line or, or maybe feed mill. You know, these half of the farms, they use this feed mill and these other half of the farms, they use a different feed mill. Were there other things in there that maybe you couldn't um, allocate directly, but you could measure? measure and assign some sort of correlation to? That's a, a great question, Dr. Johnson. And we try to control that in the models. So the, in the statistical models, we add the, the variables of the farm because we have the information at least of what, uh, which site they, they were allocated and which south farm they came from. So we try to add that on the statistical model, kind of controlling for the, for the facilities and where these pigs were placed to see if we had different and the difference remains. So in the model, we try to uh, address all of these characteristics. Some things, of course, we don't have like in, uh, in, in, in the model because we don't have all the data, right? But at least controlling for the farm effect itself, we could, we, we could do that. Did you see that the source farm, the, the sow farm or the breeder farm, the site one, did you see that have a direct impact as in, you know, the, the batches from this sow farm, they always ended up in quartile four or they always had a lot of Lawsonia. Were there any direct correlations to PCV2 or Lawsonia volume that you could just assign to the source farm? 
Yeah, perfect question, Dr. Johnson. And yeah, it's like we didn't see like anything related to the site one in this specific case, uh, in this specific study. And that was uh, give us even more like uh, evidence that what happened in the growth finish is exactly what impacted there and not exactly like the effect of the south farm that they were coming from. So um, exactly what happened in the growth finish site and this uh, introduction of these pathogens is that what caused like these specific problems that we evaluate in this study. There's a whole bunch of finishing people that don't like that message at all, Gilear. <laughs> step, step number one, and I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anybody, step number one in finishing is blame the, blame the sow farm until proven otherwise. And I know that I'm, I'm making a joke there, right? But um, I think that's a very important observation that in this situation, you, like you said, we observed it being basically what happened in finishing was what impacted the results, and it wasn't directly correlated to source. Uh, last question, Guilherme, I'll ask you to put your veterinarian hat on. You've got three pathogens that are an opportunity that you studied pretty in depth and you see the performance on. Let's say that producer calls you up and says, Guilherme, I don't care what it is, but I want the mortality to be better. Um, which pathogen would you target to work on first? Which, And not necessarily what's the most impactful, but what do you think is the best value because you can move the needle, so to say, or you can make an improvement very fast with medicine or, you know, uh, biosecurity or vaccines, whatever, which pathogen would you try to tackle first? Or do you think it's silly to tackle one and you should, you absolutely need to try and tackle all three of them? That's a great question, Dr. Johnson. And that's one thing that I think is the message of the project itself. That is, I mean, we cannot focus in one single pathogen in the swine industry. Unfortunately, we have like faced multiple of them all the time. And sometimes we cannot control of them. It's like you said, like we cannot tackle the three of them at the same time. But at least one message that I see is that the, the timing affected as well. So when purrs enter the farm, it falls like when the nursery age or the early finish or the, or the late finish also impact. So if you can push the disease to happen uh, as late as possible, for example, in, in case if, uh, if a disease that we're not going to see like, a lot of mortality when it enters, or if we can avoid them to, uh, to happen at the same time, that that's a problem as well, right? If we get a introduction of multiple pathogens in one single point is going to be worse than get all the introduction of them but at different times of the life of the animal right so then we can tackle them separately you know so that's i think would be the main message of the project but coming back to your question i mean for sure first virus is always the target right like uh affects the uh, immune knowledge of the animal right so if they get immune depressed and in this case, like all of them were negative batches and they got introduction of birds in the finishing side. So for me, that's the main message, right? Biosecurity and avoid at least that these multiple pathogens enter your growth finish sites because some of them are endemic. We cannot avoid them enter, but at least we have some vaccine strategies or antibiotics that we can make to control or at least postpone them to have clinical issues. Fantastic information, Guilherme. You uh, and the team at Iowa State do an amazing job with uh, research. Um, and I really appreciate you coming on the podcast again here and sharing that update with our audience. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. My pleasure to be here again. Well, we got to thank the audience, Guilherme. Um, to the folks out there that listen, thank you very much for being a part of this. Uh, please like and subscribe to the podcast if you would. Uh, it helps to get the message uh, that Guilherme has and all our awesome guests has out uh, to everybody. Um, please go to the website, check it out. If you haven't uh, seen our other episodes, if you're a new listener, go to the website swinehealthblackbelt.com where you can find this episode with Guilherme. You can find the last episode we did with Guilherme and every episode we've done in between. Um, so please check that website out if you haven't. For Dr. Guilherme Cesar, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to chat with you about dynamic pig health, and we certainly hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Johnson.